Hello, everybody. We still have people joining the webinar, so I'm just going to wait a little bit longer to let everybody get on. So I'm uh, Andy Nathan in the Weatherhead East Asian Institute, and I'm thrilled to welcome Darren Byler to speak to us about Xinjiang. A year or so ago, a year and a half ago or so, I uh, moderated a discussion that he did online uh, on his uh, report called In the Camps, which is a report uh, the, under the auspices of the Columbia Global Reports a very, very good study, and he gave a wonderful talk then. He's a, he ha, uh, I'm proud to say that he got a master's degree at Columbia in 2009, and um, then his PhD at the University of Washington in anthropology. It teaches now at Simon Fraser University. He has a recent super book called Terror Capitalism, which he'll talk about a little bit, uh, but here he's mainly going to talk about a novel uh, written by a Uyghur uh, who uh, and um, co-translated by Darren and and published here in the United States uh, English translation. So he's going to talk about both of these projects, especially the novel, for forty minutes or so, and in the meantime. While he's speaking or at the end, you can put your questions or comments in, into the Q&A uh, button down at the bottom of your screen, and we'll deal with as many of them as we can in the last part of this session. So um, with that uh, said, I really welcome you, Darren. I enjoyed our last conversation, even though it was all online very much, so I look forward to this one. Uh, thanks so much, Andy. Uh, thanks for having me, hosting me again. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, like Andy said, I'll, I'll be talking mostly about uh, the novel that I co-translated. Um, but I'll also talk about the context of translating it and how it fits fits into my, my broader work as an anthropologist. So the title of my talk is Reading the Backstreets in Urumqi, Translating, Translation as Eth Ethnographic Practice, method and practice of refusal. Um, so I'll start by sort of laying out Xinjiang, the Uyghur autonomous region in Northwest China. Um, it's a recent history, it's situation within China as an internal settler colony and also as a frontier of the global economy. And then I'll, I'll move to talking about the novel and the process of translating it, reading it and thinking with it. So the, the books that I've published most recently are these two, um, Terror Capitalism, uh, which is out through Duke University Press. And this, this book um, began, you know, the research for it began already in 2010 um, and was involved 25 months of field work in the, in the region, in uh, Urumqi, which is the capital of the region. Um, th this field work was, happened between 2010 and 2018. And the basic argument of the book is that what's happening in Northwest China is something that should be thought of as a new sequence in racialized surveillance capitalism um, that is using the figure of the terrorist and the Muslim, particularly Muslim men, um, as an object to that it has to be produced through surveillance and knowledge gathering, intelligence, um, and through new definitions of what counts as good behavior or, or um, legal behavior in the region and in China. Um, and, and as part of that process, um, their bodies, their way of life is opened up to surveillance and the data that's extracted from it becomes a, a source of value for technology companies. And then they are also being put to work in factories um, associated with a, an internment camp system. Um, which I, I also think of as, as something related to the workhouse and to factory work. So that's the basic argument of the book and really is the, the main way I think, I think about this is in the first three chapters of the book, thinking through the way that Uyghur social reproduction, which is all of the ways that Uyghurs produce their own futures um, through family life, through community life, um, 
how all of those things are, are being devalued and enclosed through both material enclosures and digital enclosures, and how together those things produce a process of dispossession, of taking their land, taking their labor, taking their way of life. Um, all of these are features of, of what I think of as a, a colonial relationship that's being established um, uh, now. It's emergent uh, in Northwest China. So that's the first half of the book. But the second half of the book focuses on how Uyghurs are living despite these circumstances. We're already in 2014 and 15, as I was conducting a lot of the, the field work, um, how they are producing forms of palliative care, caring for each other through forms of friendship and storytelling, and how those um, ways of caring for each other build a kind of lateral agency. So they feel empowered because they share um, they share friendships with each other, they share relationships of care with each other. Um, they're respected by each other, even as they're not respected by the police, by the settlers that surround them. Um, and so it's a way of fi finding a way to live despite really extreme circumstances. Um, I also talk about how some Han people uh, from the majority group in China that are living in the city also tried to um, protect Uyghurs as they could um, as a sort of a grassroots politics of solidarity. Uh, this was a, 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 a small proportion of the population that, that were reaching out to care for, for Uyghurs. But I wanted to highlight their role in, in protecting Uyghurs um, because I think it, it indicates what could be done, um, how Uyghurs could, could find solidarity with others. As part of the process of the writing that second half of the book, um, I and researching it, I engaged the uh, this novel, The Backstreets, um, first reading it and then beginning to translate it with a, a friend, um, and then the text itself, stories that emerge in the text became uh, a resource for me as I interviewed young migrants. I asked them about. I said, "I'm working on this novel, and it's this is what's happening in the novel." Um, how does this speak to your own life? Um, and so I'll, I'll talk more about that um, in the second half of the talk. But just to make sure we're all aware of what's happening in Northwest China, um, the story I tell in Terror Capitalism begins in the 1990s and, and 2000s as China is becoming uh, an export-oriented economy, is turning towards, uh, towards capitalism. Um, and becoming a manufacturer for the world and, and needing raw materials to drive that economy. And so lots of uh, settlers in China, in, in, in the Uyghur region, moved during this period of time. Um, they were incentivized by the state and by state-owned corporations, by private corporations to make this move. When they arrived, they built out the hard infrastructure and really began to settle in the Uyghur majority areas here in the South um, for the first time. Um, initially, they were interested in natural resources like coal, oil, and natural gas. Um, this region is, is very resource rich and a, around a, the source of around 20% 20 of Chinese oil and natural gas. And as the infrastructure was put in place, they also began to develop large scale agriculture, um, industrial agriculture focused on cotton. And today, around 20% um, or so of the world's supply of cotton comes from this region. This had a dramatic effect on the Uyghur population. It, it meant that the cost of living began to rise, um, but because they were largely excluded from the lucrative parts of the economy, from the natural resource sector, they saw themselves becoming poorer relative to the, the new incomers, the, the settlers. They also saw over time their, their institutions being captured by the, the, by the settlers, um, their schooling system, the banking system, um, they saw new restrictions on religious practice. All of these things made Uyghurs more and more desperate to find a way forward in their lives. And, and much of the tension that we see in the Uyghur region results from this basic material antagonism of, of land and labor um, and um, a, a differential way of valuing people based on their religious practice and their ethnicity. So the Uyghurs themselves are a group of around 12 million people. They're indigenous to this region. Um, there's an important book 
written by Ryan Thumb that talks about how Uyghur identity is, is built out of oral storytelling and visitation to sacred shrines. The Uyghurs are Muslim. They've been Muslim for over a thousand years. Um, but there's a Sufi practice of, of shrine visitation that's built into their practice of Islam um, and really begins to, to build a sacred landscape uh, for them, a sort of rootedness in place. They are a place-based people. Um, and then in moving forward in time in the in the 20th century, they also established their own states um, in, in, in some, some areas of the region called the East Turkestan Islamic Republic, uh, East, East Turkestan Republic. Um, and so there is this a national identification as an ethnic group, um, as a nationality um, that is central to who, who they are today. When I was first going to the region in, in the 2010s, um, there was a lot of things happening. Um, I was interested in the space because it, it seemed as though this was a group of people um, who had a lot of vibrant traditions that were being carried forward into the present. Uh, but I could also see that there's the, their urban context, their the, the in places where they lived were, were being transformed quite quickly. They were being forced in some ways to um, replace, destroy and replace their own uh, living arrangements. Um, this is an image taken from Kashgar, which is the, the center of, of Uyghur culture, uh, where um, parts of the city are being demolished by the Uyghurs. And then these people, you know, this is likely where they actually live, they're being moved to government housing. Um, what I was observing in my field work was migration. Uh, young men primarily uh, because of the gender politics in, in Uyghur society uh, were being sent to live in urban contexts like Hotan, Kashgar, Aksu, and then in some cases moving from there onto Urumqi, which is the capital of the region. Often this was sort of temporary migrant work. They were hoping to make more money to support their family members back in the villages. Um, and so it was a, a sort of period of life that many were engaging with. And this, this population became my, my research population. They said they came to the city for economic opportunities, but that they also were interested in greater religious freedom because in the countryside, human surveillance is more intense. Um, the policing is stricter. And in the city, there's more anonymity. And so in 2014, this is what prayers look like at the mosque. Um, in the, the, the largest mosque in, in the Uyghur majority uh, neighborhoods of, of Urumqi. In May 2014, the state declared the people's war on terror. Um, this was in, in relation to um, violent incidents carried out by Uyghur civilians towards Han civilians. Um, but very quickly it moved beyond uh, sort of counter-terrorism or counter, actually criminal investigation to a sort of preventative policing operation that was targeting the entire population as a whole. Um, and so Muslim behavior in general uh, became outlawed um, in the space of several years. Um, it was framed as a de-extremification or de-radicalization campaign, um, but and as an implementation of a, of a counter-terrorism law, but really became the justification for mass internment um, and forced labor, um, all of the things that we see now um, in the news regarding the, the Uyghur region. As part of the rhetoric uh, of the People's War on Terror, there was the outlawing of, of the way that you know, Muslim appearance, you know, wearing hijabs, having beards if you're under the age of 55, having Islamic symbols on your clothing and so on. But there was also in the media discourse, which is owned by the state, um, a framing of religious pious Muslims as vermin, um, as rats, as snakes, and so on. Um, and we know, thinking historically and also contemporarily in other contexts, that when you begin to dehumanize people, um, framing them as rats or as vermin, um, which you see here um, in the context of Nazi Germany, and you see here in the context of 2015, United Kingdom, uh, referring to uh, refugees who are seeking asylum in, in Europe. Um, when you begin to frame people in these ways, uh, you're opening uh, up a, an operation of dehumanization. Um, and I'm sharing this here because the novel also deals in these terms or thinks, thinks about this process. 
Um, in the spring of 2017, the police began to rank Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims using uh, categories of extremism or pre-criminal behavior, um, crimes that were not serious enough to rise to the level of criminality. They used 10 categories, at least in some contexts, to evaluate people based on their age and ethnicity and employment status, and then also their travel history um, and their, relig their religious practice. Did this person pray daily? Do they have religious knowledge? Um, have they over have they uh, taught their children at in their homes about Islam? Each category that applies to the person results in the deduction of ten points. Um, and if you have enough categories that apply to you, you move into um, from from safe or trustworthy to normal to untrustworthy. Uh, many, many people, hundreds of thousands of people were deemed untrustworthy through this process and also through other processes um, relating to technological surveillance. Um, a, a lot of what I try to focus, focus on in my book is, is the way that state security and a, a multi-billion dollar private industry um, works together and with low-level police, around 60,000 data police or low-level um, assistant police who man checkpoints and scan phones and so on, and, and regular police, um, to first break the autonomy of the Uyghur internet, uh, because Uyghurs were using language, Uyghur language, that wasn't fully um, available to the censors. They couldn't quite understand what people were saying. And so they had to develop new technologies to assess language um, and also imagery. Uh, so initially it was about breaking autonomy, and then over time it became about enclosing the space and, um, and, and then bringing the data that was being collected into the market. There's well, 1,400 tech firms working in the region, um, the computer vision corporations who work here and in other parts of the country. Um, a, a study has shown that within two years of working on a state security project, they develop commercial products. Um, and so there's a... a, a there's a military industrial security industrial complex that's in motion here. Um, it moves very quickly from um, state security to commercialization, um, just in the space of a couple of years. Along with this, the, the uh, technology and the surveillance is supporting hundreds of camps and uh, smart factories, which are you know checkpoint and camera. Um, camera dense spaces. Hundreds of thousands of unfree Muslim workers are, are put into these camps and factories. One of the tools that they've used to de develop this is this tool, which is um, what in the Chinese discourse is called a Chinese a, a counterterrorism sword. Um, and the, my research has shown that this is connected pretty directly to Israeli Celebrite Systems, which is the world's largest forensics company, digital forensics company. Um, and then was uh, further developed in China by Chinese companies, and now is being used very widely in, in Uyghur and Kazakh regions. Um, it's important to sort of think about the geopolitics and the travel of these tools, because it shows the way that um, you know, settler colonial systems move from place to place, um, and also the capacity of these things, which is this tool can scan someone's phone and look at their digital history, see if they've used WeChat, um, in ways that the state does not approve, or if they've installed a VPN, a virtual private network, which is the sort of thing that many people have done, including my co-translator um, and the author of the novel, Perhat Tursun. Um, it was very common in 2014 and 15. Um, and we know that hundreds of thousands of people have been caught uh, through uh, digital scans of their materials. So this is some background in terms of like what's actually happening in the region. Um, there's a third element of this and uh, which speaks more directly to Parhat Tursun, the author of the novel, um, which is that in addition to all of these sort of you know, technological and human surveillance aspects of the system that we're really targeting regular regular Uyghurs, there was also a group of people who were targeted more directly. Um, and these were intellectuals, uh, cultural leaders in the region um, who were frequently labeled two-faced people. Um, this is a, a essay in The Diplomat that was written by Menthman Allah, who's a, a Uyghur intellectual himself and a friend of Perhat Tursun, the author of the novel, talking about how Uyghurs in general, many who are 
uh, Uyghur leaders in general, who, many of whom were you know, leaders of institutions, were party members, were model citizens, um, how they were labeled two-faced, which meant that in private, they secretly supported Uyghurs or in, in Uyghur struggles and were critical of the state, but in public would pr promote um, the state's agenda. Um, how these people who, are, who are, seem to have dual loyalties um, were rounded up um, and often sentenced to very long sentence, sentences in prison. Parhat Tursun was one of these people um, Perhat is a poet, author, and a public intellectual. Um, he was born in Atush, which is close to Kashgar, in 1969, and he received his PhD from Minzu University in Beijing. He was you know, one of the first sort of cohorts of Uyghurs to um, have the opportunity to study uh, outside of the Uyghur region in, in, in Chinese language. When I talked to him about this process, he said, you know, what really attracted him to do this was he wanted to learn Chinese in order to read world literature and philosophy. Already as a teenager, he had been writing poetry um, and he'd been reading some works in translation, um, but he, he really wanted to know more about the world and he wanted to understand how the Uyghur history and, and representations of Uyghur stories could be thought of as in dialogue with world literature and philosophy. Um, after he began publishing his work, after he came back to the region, um, he was viewed as quite controversial. Um, and uh, this had to do with the way he discussed religion, sexuality in his writing, um, really the way he was engaging um, some of the, philosoph the philosophical uh, writing that he had um, studied in, in university. He's a modernist figure who is um, writing against tradition in some ways, although he's also engaging tradition and sort of building a different future for tradition. He became a leader of, among a new generation of Uyghur writers and poets and translators. Um, they had on, uh, on WeChat, which is a social media app that Uyghurs were using quite widely in 2014 and 15, they had a, a, a avant-garde poetry salon where people would po post their poetry and, and works as they were emerging. And they met frequently um, to discuss their work as well. Um, in January, 2018, Torsun disappeared. Um, this was around the same time as many other intellectuals were disappearing. Um, and then um, reports emerged later that he had been sentenced to 16 years in prison, um, possibly as early as one month after his detention. The reasons for his arrest are not fully known. It could have been because of his technology use. Um, you know, up until 2017, he had been communicating with me about the translation of the book um, using a VPN, using um, apps that the state would later uh, deem terrorist tools. Um, it's not clear why he was arrested. It could be because he had signed a petition asking the Chinese government to respect Uyghur language. Um, in any case, Parhat Tursun was not a, a political radical or ad advocating for any sort of violence. Um, he was using his mind um, to think and represent um, his life and the lives of many people around him. So you know, what, what drew me to him and his work is really some of my training as an anthropologist. Um, I was really drawn to um, sort of literary traditions in anthropology to um, uh, sort of phenomenological frames and existentialist frames of anthropology, um, which tries to think about how humans recreate, create their worlds through storytelling. That's one of the ways that it, it does this. And the work of Michael D. Jackson was really influential in um, making me think, think about this. Um, what storytelling does is it, is, is it puts humans in their social relations and creates a life world, um, which is the community that they inhabit and, and also the view that they have of the past and the future. Um, it allows authors to make sense of their lives, um, to narrativize them. Um, and as it's doing that, it restores agency or, or gives agency to the author or the teller. Um, and if it's effective, it can move the reader. Um, it can help readers to identify 
with um, the author and with what the you know the, the stories that the author is telling. It can build a collective or imagined community, um, which is something that Benedict Anderson has talked about. Um, you know, has been in something in, in scholarly discussion for a long time. Um, it also can evoke a sort of higher truth about what ought to be, which is a, a sort of ethical stance. Um, it it, it um, it's a sort of presents a sort of poetic truth, something that resists symbolization, something that's actually difficult to say, but can be evoked through imagery, through interaction, through narrative. Um, and as a as an anthropologist looking at a, a society that I'm not a part of, I'm a you know, white American settler from Ohio. Um, it can also help to open up a world into the epistemology, the knowledge system that a society has. Um, and I, during my time at Columbia, I, I learned from Gayatri Spivak in a talk she gave um, that really what's happening here is a kind of deep cultural learning. Um, it's, it's a translation and, and reading literature of, of a group that you're not a part of, um, helps you to engage that group in a way that you wouldn't be able to otherwise as an outsider. Um, and so for me, it became a way of sort of shortcutting some of the things that I would have taken years and years for me to understand or even think think to know, think to ask about, um, because it, it, it conveyed uh, so much of, of, of life um, and gave me a, a way to, to frame questions for others um, that, you know, really shaped my work. So I'd, I've been thinking about literature as something I wanted to engage, and I'd, um, as part of my doctoral training, I'd um, met a, a Uyghur intellectual um, in Urumqi, and then he was able to come to my university, and, and we basically did our PhDs together, um, Mutalib Enwar, and we translated a, a short story as part of our work together, and, and I really saw some of the richness that's there in Uyghur language through that translation. Um, and so as I was thinking about my work, which was about these migrants coming to the city, I wanted to find something that represented what they experienced. Um, and, and so um, a friend introduced me to Perhat Torsen's novel, uh, The Backstreets, and I started reading it and realized, oh, this is really world-class literature and deserves a broader audience. Um, and so I and another friend started to, to work on translating it. Um, but of course, like translating a novel in this context um, is potentially dangerous uh, because of all of the restrictions that, that, that are put on knowledge production. And so I wanted to share a little bit of, of that experience of, of actually translating the novel. Um, so I, I wrote a short piece as I was publishing the, the novel uh, for Words Without Borders, and I'll just read you a few sentences from it. This actually comes from the opening scene of, of Terror Capitalism. Um, the, the other book that I wrote. The man was sitting three tables away from us, dressed in a black jacket and striped polo shirt. He looked like an average middle-aged Uyghur man. He seemed to be talking intently on his smartphone. Over small glasses of tea, Turkish tea, A and I were reading the tra and translating a novel, a Uyghur novel called The Backstreets. We'd been meeting this way each morning for several weeks. The problem was the same man had been sitting three tables away from us the day before. Two days in a row seemed like too much. I whispered to A, who had his back to the man, I think that man might be following us. I nodded at the man with a tilt of my head. He was in the same spot yesterday. I might just be paranoid, but he might be taking pictures while he pretends to talk on his phone. A's face went white. He lurched to his feet. We took off, walking in different directions, trying to see if anyone was following us. Back in 2014, facial recognition cameras and checkpoints had not yet been installed across the city, so tracking people in space required human intelligence. We deleted WeChat from our phones in case we were detained and forced to show the Ministry of State Security agents our contacts and chat histories. But there was not much we could do to delete the text messages on our smartphone, and we knew that Tencent and China Mobile could always share our information with the MSS if they were really serious about investigating us. Several hours later, I texted A to see if he had spotted anything unusual. Nothing. After waiting a day, we started meeting again, relieved that it must have been a coincidence. We smoked our cheap Hong He cigarettes and laughed at our paranoia. We went back to our tea in our corner of the tea house, quietly translating our novel, the first long form work of Uyghur fiction to appear in English. 
Translating the novel helped A to think about his own life, his upbringing in a village that was slowly overrun by Han settlers, and the way the promise of education and economic development was withheld by racialized institutions that slotted him into token positions at best and repelled him as unwanted vermin at worst. Though he, was, he found a way to pursue his obsession chemistry after leaving college, A's work at the chemical factory and then as a science teacher was undermined by the way his coworkers and students smirked at his accented Mandarin and mocked his, his hair and mannerisms. He felt that everywhere he turned, he was asked, what are you doing here? This is why he was stuck in, a ghetto, in the ghettoized Uyghur enclaves of the city, hiding from the Chinese gaze. We met in the tea shop to do the translation because an American anthropologist like me meeting an underemployed Uyghur with fidgety hands like A in either of our apartments might raise suspicion with the civil affairs ministry personnel who had installed QR codes on every apartment door. They scanned the codes, which pulled up high resolution images and digital records of registered inhabitants with their smartphones and conducted surprise inspections of Muslim homes every few days, looking for unregistered people. So it's better to do the translation out in the open, taking advantage of the vibrant tea culture that Uyghurs share with peoples throughout Western and South Asia. We tried to reassure, reassure ourselves that we, had, we did not have anything to hide. The only thing we were doing was making an all too common Uyghur story of systematic discrimination accessible to the English reading world. But we knew even this action of, translation, of translating an everyday reality was transgressive. And this shared knowledge, along with the rhythm we developed as co-translators, built an intimacy between us. Translating the back streets with A was intense. It meant poring over complex grammatical structures and odd turns of phrase, trying to get at the emot e emotive equivalence of each line. But more than the li literal meaning of the words, it taught me about the rich knowledge system and world of experience that shapes Uyghur life, things that were impossible for me to learn in a college classroom. It guided me to a whole new set of questions to ask the dozens of young Uyghurs I interviewed about their past and their imagined futures as part of my ethnographic research. Most importantly, it showed me what it means to be a friend and to sit next to the pain and loneliness of someone in the midst of deep, intractable depression. Reading the text together allowed me to dwell on A's rage. It showed me how the trauma of colonization seeps into all aspects of life. It shapes individuals' possibilities, their life paths, but it doesn't erase their agency, their ability to narrate their own story. It doesn't do this, but I found that it, it, narrows, it narrows their agency and their ability. When I left the region in 2015, I promised Perhat Tursun and A that I would find a publisher for the novel. But instead, I waited. I wanted to make sure that the media attention that publication would bring wouldn't cause undue harm to either of them. In 2017, A reached out to me to tell me he couldn't re remain in direct contact with me and other foreigners as he had before. Several months later, another friend from his village told me he had been taken to a camp near his home village in southern Xinjiang, far from the city. Around the same time, I heard the news that Perhat Tursun had disappeared as well. So that's just a bit of what it was like to, to work on this novel and the process of you know, what I learned from it and, and, and how I was thinking about um, the, the process of publishing it. The novel itself um, you know, is about um, a young man coming to the city. Um, the plot is relatively simple. It's um, a young Uyghur man who finds a job after he graduates from college as a temporary intern in a government office. Um, but though he has this something of a toehold in the city, he can't find a, a place to rent, a place to live, a place to sleep. And so the, the plot of the novel is basically this young man in his interaction with his, his office mates, the, his boss, who's a, a, a Chinese person and many of his coworkers who are also Han. Um, and the way that they interact with him, all of the forms of aggression he feels from them, um, the kind of you know, hatred that's really kind of simmering under the surface and the way they regard him as, as, as lacking um, and as less than human in some cases. 
Um, that in in humanity is something that he ex experiences as well through passerbyers, passersby as he as he walks down the streets looking for a place to stay. Um, and this is one of the scenes that Perhat added as we were translating the novel because he really wanted to he wanted the reader to really understand um, the context that he was speaking of and the way that sort of genocidal rage was being enacted um, towards towards Uyghurs. Um, and so this is a scene where he has over 200 chops that he's added to this uh, as a paragraph that really sort of interrupts the reader and makes them really sit and, and think. Um, you can't really skip over this paragraph. Um, and what's being said in, and he makes it clear is in Chinese, um, is uh, someone uh, who's saying he wants to kill all of the people of the six cities or chop all the people of the six cities. The six cities are the, the ancestral homelands of, of the Uyghurs this, in the southern part of the region. Um, and so he's enacting this sort of genocidal rage. Um, this is something that I think is simmering throughout the entire novel. Um, the idea that Uyghurs have been given development as a sort of gift from the Chinese state, um, which they experience as their colonization. Um, but from the settler perspective is, is, is the, their rejecting of this gift is, it makes them appear to be ungrateful. Um, there's also in the way that it's presented a, 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 an understanding that people who arrive quite recently are more inclined um, to view the Uyghurs with a kind of racialized ethnic hatred as, as people that don't deserve to live there that are simply a nuisance. Um, and so, you know, what's, what's being described is something that I observed as I was doing field work in the region and it was told to me by dozens and dozens of young Uyghurs that I interviewed, um, how they encountered blank stares, service refusals, and threats when they went to, to um, the shopping mall or to the corner store, um, or when they applied for jobs or went to the bank, you know, all of the, the ways in which they were, they were pushed to the side and marginalized. Um, it also, in the way that people are being dehumanized in the novel, speaks to all of the ways that taxi drivers would refer to Uyghurs that they saw outside on the sidewalk as towel heads or leather heads because of the way that they covered their hair, um, and at times as dogs and, and other um, racialized slurs. This is something that my co-translator said is, you know, that we feel as though we're being herded like animals. What Perhat is saying at the end of this long sentence of chops, or paragraph of chops, is that um, we, that I was all, always already the one he was going to chop. That it didn't matter what his ethnic, like what he did as a person, because of his status, his ethnic status, um, his existence itself was being called into question. Um, one of the the you know, key moments in the text. Um, is, um, and there's many of these, but this is one that I, I think is particularly important, um, is the way that he was treated by his boss in, in the um, office where he was working. Um, so I'll just read a bit of this. Before I used to like smiley face people, but after I started working in the office, I saw enough of the smiling boss and began to hate smiling faces. This was because his smiles were so madding, maddingly cruel and hateful. Although, although I only revealed slightly that I didn't like I, this sort of expression, he kicked up angrily like water that was boiling over, telling me of my, of my position and reputation in urban society. He accused me of having no social position, no talent to do anything. He said I didn't even have a reputation to lose. In his view, he was a famous artist who was accomplish, accomplishing great things. Talking to me was just a waste of his own time. <laughs> was not just a waste of his own time, but was actually the crime of wasting the time of his entire ethnic nation nationality. Even at that moment when he was exploding with anger, he didn't lose the pleasant expression on his face. He asked me over and over to tell him what I had the ability to do. He repeated the sentence again and again. I told him that I had the ability to live. That's right. The greatest thing in, in the world is living. There's nothing greater than living. What outraged him the most was that I was alive. Therefore, my ability to live must be of great value. My existence itself was the greatest source of frustration for him. 
Um, uh, that last line, my existence itself was the greatest source of frustration for him, is something that, that speaks to um, a framing of, of what is happening in this novel as a kind of refusal. Um, I think this text should be read alongside uh, text um, and scholarship that's focused on uh, indigenous experiences of colonization elsewhere. Um, so there's a, a book of uh, called Indigenous Cities that looks at urban Indian fiction in North America um, as, as a way of, of sort of building a future for indigenous societies as they move through space. Um, and there's an important book called Mohawk Interruptus by Audra Simpson, who herself is Mohawk, talking about how Mohawk people that live on the border between Canada and the United States enact forms of refusal, um, a kind of priorness to the, to the existence of the state, um, and really do that by holding on to their existence, refusing to give up, to uh, give up on their traditions, their language, um, and so on. I think this text can also be read in dialogue with Invisible Man and the Warmth of Other Suns, which is looking at um, migration from the South to the North in, in the United States of, 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 of Black people. And Invisible Man itself is something that Parhat was thinking quite a lot about um, as he was writing this novel. Um, of course, there's you know real differences between black experience in and of slavery and, and Jim Crow in in North America, and the Uyghur experience, but there's also some similarities. Um, so for Simpson, Audra Simpson, indigenous refusal um, is distinct from resistance. It's not as though people are just pushing back against the state in a reactive way. Instead, it's that they're holding on to a priorness, to their right to exist, that they have existed before the state has arrived, before the settlers have arrived. Um, and so refusing is, a, is about uh, refusing to be silenced through processes of removal from the land, uh, imprisonment, dislocation, and disorientation. Um, which is something that that Perhat talks about, and my co-translator picked up on very quickly as well. That um, what's happening in the novel is a way is be, what's being described is the way that um, migrants experience city life um, and uh, try to make it match their, you know, what happened in their villages or bring parts of village life into the city. Um, and so there's uh, a refusal to forget um, that is enacted through their daily practices. Um, another thing that Perhat is doing is he's actually naming the process of dispossession. He's showing it in action. He's describing institutional domination, what happens when your boss is acting in this way, um, how that feels for the colonized. And he's evoking life lived in occupation. Um, he's portraying that. Um, in, a, in a really rich way. He's also asking, demanding a kind of recognition and writing for solidarity. Um, you know, some of Perhat's greatest inspirations are um, post-colonial literature um, and existentialist philosophy, writers like Camus, um, writers um, like J.M. Kotsea, who, who actually read and blurbed the book, um, which is a nice moment for Perhat. Um, you know, writing about the South African experience of apartheid. Perhat and many others that are writing in this way, um, kind of demanding a seat at the table, are, are provincializing world history by writing about it from below and from the margins. Um, and so by writing in English or having his work translated in English, he is he's, you know, demanding a place um, in, in the canon. Um, Hopefully that will happen. Um, he's also building Uyghur futures um, by building forms of solidarity, um, by making this text available to broader audiences. I hope that, that will, will happen. Um, I played a very small role in all of this. You know, my co-translator and Parhat, um, they saw this as, as a sort of passion project. And, and I did too. I mean, I saw it as really important work. But for me, it was a real privilege, one of the greatest honors of my life to, to play a small role um, in bringing this to the world. Um, and I'm you know, happy to see that people are recognizing the, the, the stakes of this, of this book and also the beauty that's there in the midst of all of the tragedy 
um, that's being described in the text. So I'll leave it at that um, and really looking forward to a conversation with you all. <clears throat> Darren, thank you very much. That was very, very interesting. So far, we have only one question in the Q&A, but I think a lot of people were probably waiting to see where you were going with it and they'll be adding questions. Let me ask a couple things. Was this novel ever available in Uyghur? Mm -hmm. What form? Um, so yes, it was mostly available in Uyghur. Uh, it had been published in the end of 2013 uh, mm -hmm. on a internet forum as part of a collection of, of, of Perhat's work. Um, so it was just published as a digital PDF, which is how I got access to it. Um, a friend of Perhat's introduced me to the text, um, but I started reading it before I had met Perhat. Um, it wasn't until I decided that it would be worth pursuing a translation of it that I actually I met with him and and he was you know really happy to have it um, have it to have it translated. He he edited it a bit as we are translating, adding a few things that he thought uh, would make it more effective as a text. Um, and so those edits didn't appear in the Uyghur translation. So that, that scene where there's all the chops was something that, that hadn't appeared in the, in the, the original regime, Uyghur. The government let it be on the internet for a short period of time, I suppose? Yeah, so I, during the like 2011 to 2014 or 15, um, the state really didn't have the capacity to control the Uyghur internet. They could turn it on and off, but they couldn't assess what people were saying. They just didn't have the tools to censor Uyghur speech. Um, and so there was a moment there where there's a lot of cultural flourishing of cultural production of people self-publishing things. Um, they knew that there were lines that they shouldn't cross. You know, Perhat is censoring himself as he writes this. It was part of the vagueness of the text has to do with that. Um, but, you know, there, there was just a much much fewer restrictions there for a moment. And then as the People's War on Terror took, took over and all of the technological surveillance systems were built, um, almost all of the Uyghur internet was deleted. And so there's been this mass displacement of knowledge, uh, just a removal of knowledge um, that was built up over uh, a decade or so. So you um, describe your sense of honor in doing this and how important it is to do it. And I sympathize with that from my experience of editing the Tiananmen papers and supervising the translation there. But it must be very sad for you that these two people with whom you worked so closely have disappeared into the system, perhaps partly because of the, of their uh, involvement in this project, right? Do you think that had something to do with it? It's not clear what what was the cause. Um, so I'm the co-translator um, who in my in my terror capitalism book, I refer to him as Abla Kim, which is not, it's a pseudonym. It's not his real name. Um, and so I was almost trying to say Abla Kim, which is how I come to think of him. Um, but anyway, he, he was, he was in contact with many foreigners. Um, he had used some of the technology tools that the state doesn't want. And he was also a pious Muslim. Like he fasted during Ramadan, really normal Muslim stuff, um, but was something that would cause concern um, it, as the state was implementing the system. So he could have been detained for a whole variety of reasons. It could be because of his involvement with me or others. Um, I don't think they knew about this translation, as far as I know. Um, it, it, it was something we had done quite a long time before. He was detained three or four years before. Mm. Um, and I hadn't really even started moving on, on publishing it yet and, as an English translation. Um, Perhat, you know, he was really pushing me to publish it. So he was contacting me fairly often, asking about the status of publishing it. And I was trying to sort of find some excuses to sort of slow walk it because I was, I thought it could cause some problems for him. Yeah. And, you know, I knew it was something I wanted to publish, but I I, I didn't want to cause undue harm. There's Once they both were disappeared, and, and especially after Perhat was sentenced, I thought, you know, at this point, there's really nothing preventing me from moving forward. Um, 
and we, I, you know, I still am maintaining the anonymity of my co-translator, but for Farhat, like, I think the, the worst has happened already to him. Um, and he, he wants this work to be known. And, and, and so I, I felt like now was the time to publish it. Yeah. So your, your field work, you said, I think ended in 2018 and has, t tell us a little bit about access to Xinjiang for you mm. in those years and since that time. Mm -hmm. So in 2014 and 15, which is when I did the bulk of my field work, I could live there fairly. I mean, there was there was a lot of surveillance and a lot of controls, but I could I could live and do some work. Um, so as long as I was in the city and affiliated with an institution, which I, I had, um, I didn't feel as though I was being watched that closely. Um, I, people I was interacting with weren't being you know detained by the police and questioned about me or anything like that. I hadn't published much of anything, and so I was a sort of unknown quantity, I think, on the on the part of the police. And my you know role in the institution was to learn Uyghur language as part of it. <laughs> um, and so learning Uyghur was a normal thing, and you know translating a novel would be part of that process. Um, the in in the city, um, foreigners were seen as a kind of value add in the institution. It meant that you. Um, that the institution had a sort of cosmopolitan presence and, you know, people wanted to learn English and, and all of these sorts of things. Um, in 2018, the situation was quite different. Um, many people I had known before, um, dozens of them had disappeared into this camp system. Um, and hundreds of thousands of people were missing in the city. Um, and so, I went to the same neighborhoods, the same places I had visited many times, lived in before, um, the same tea shop where I translated this novel. Um, and the situation was just dramatically different. Um, I talked to neighbors of Perhats, um, neighbors of other people I knew, and they, they confirmed that these people had been detained. Um, and, you know, in the bookshops, I'd talked to people that knew Perhat as well, and they didn't know anything. I had heard already that he had been arrested, um, but they didn't know anything more than I did. Um, they just knew that this was real, that this was happening. Um, and so my, my last visit, I was mostly just observing. I wasn't, you know, interviewing people very directly, just having these quick conversations sort of as, as you know, as part of normal activity. Um, but yeah. it was enough to, to confirm what was going on. Do we suppose that you cannot go back? I think that's a fair assumption um, based on the comments that the Public Security Bureau have made about me. Um, I think I'm a, no longer welcome um, to return. Um, I Yeah, mostly I would just not want to implicate anyone that I speak to um, by my presence. Um, and so I think, you know, doing field work or research is, is certainly out of the question for me at this point. Um, do you credit reports that the population of the camps has diminished a lot and that most of those reductions are people sent to factory work? That seems to be the case. Um, so the governor of the region announced in 20, end of 2019 that everyone in the camps, which they refer to as closed concentrated education and training facilities, um, that they had all graduated. Um, and we also know from uh, researcher visits since then um, that uh, factories were being built. The, the, the development ministry says that the camps have become a carrier of the economy because they've attracted so many companies to set up manufacturing centers there. Um, the most recent visits, like from 2021, confirmed that some spaces that before were called camps have now been, the names have simply been switched to detention centers. Um, and people that were in them before as quote unquote trainees have simply become prisoners awaiting trial. We know over 580,000 people have been criminally prosecuted and sentenced, um, most likely sentenced. Um, and many of those people were people that were previously in the camp. So one, one path is towards prison, the other path, I think, is of those that are seen as you know, more pliable and, and re-educated is um, factories. In some cases, the fact the camps have also become factories. Um, but yes, I think in general, like the, the camp spaces that were there in 2017 and 18, 19, 
um, those are no longer functioning in the same way. It's, it's now turned mostly towards factory and prison work. You said 580,000 have been, uh, have been- Since 2017, um, this is according to the state prosecutor's office in Xinjiang, um, that that many people have been prosecuted between 2017 and 2020, um, or 2020, yeah, 2021, uh, up until January, 2021. So that's a dramatic increase from previous rates of prosecution. Um, mm. Really dramatic. Um, it's uh, it could mean that you know one one in six, one in ten Muslim male is in prison. And most most of the people that were were sent to the that were prosecuted were men. Um, they are seen as the most threatening. So the original, uh, as I remember, Adrian Zen's. Um, if I have it right, um, estimate of the number of people in these re-education centers was a million. There was some, you know, controversy around this, but if half a million more than have been prosecuted, then it sounds like a million is a, you know, kind of conservative estimate of how many may have been re-educated. I think that's right. I mean, this is a, a campaign that affected all Muslims in the region to some extent. Um, almost everyone has a family member or neighbor or friend who was detained, or they're working on the other side of it as police officers or as camp personnel. Um, and so everyone's affected. It's a whole of society kind of uh, project. Um, yeah. We don't know exactly, but yes, I think millions, hundreds of thousands is uh, is a very fair estimate in terms of how many people have been detained. And when I'm going to go to the Q&A, but I just want to say when you mention all Muslims, I believe there are 12 Muslim ethnic groups. Um, does that include the Hui? I'm not sure. But they're the, so they're the Kazakhs, they're the Dungxiang, there's uh, the, um, other groups. So the, my understanding is that except for the Hui, they all were sort of equally wrapped, you know, sort of swept up in this whole event and the way not quite as much. Um, I think that's true. So there's a, around 15 million or so Muslims as a population as a whole in the region. The largest is the Uyghurs by far, around 12 million of them and a million and a half Kazakhs um, and then another million or so uh, Hui. Um, the Kazakhs traditionally live in the northern part of the region, Uyghurs live in the south. and. So I, my sense is that in places where there weren't many Uyghurs, where Uyghurs were a small proportion of the population, and there was other Muslim populations available, um, in those spaces, we see other Muslim groups being detained. Um, it seems as though the Uyghurs were targeted first and by far the most, but other groups are also targeted. Hui as well. Um, so in, in spaces where there's, you know, Hui are the majority group, we saw um, particularly pious Hui or people that had used a technology that the state was now outlawing, um, we saw them being detained. So let's look at the Q&A. So Peter Siegenthaler says, that compound always already, can you see the q and I'll read it anyway, but, um, but if you see it, then you can think about it better than you maybe can when I'm reading it. Uh, he writes, that compound, quote, always already so ubiquitous in cultural studies many years ago, appears often in your translation of the novel. Does it come from Tursun's own reading, or did you read it from between the lines of the author's Uyghur text? Well, um, so Perhat Tursun is also reading cultural studies, probably the same stuff that you are, um, and he's reading it in English and in Chinese translation. Um, so I think he is thinking in these ways that he's he, he's implying that this this framing. I mean, I'm you know I can't say that I, I haven't taken any sort of literary license in the translation in terms of trying to convey the feeling. But this is what he was trying to say: is that um, I was. I mean, you could also say already, I suppose. Um, but to say always already is to sort of emphasize the fact that this is a pre-existing condition that it cannot be removed, cannot be erased. You know, the ethnicity of this person has been racialized and proceeds before them. Um, and they, they will always already be the one who's going to be killed. Um, I, he does, I think, use a, a sort of an emphasizer uh, as he's in, in the original Uyghur, um, something quite similar to what I use in the English. 
but I can't say for sure that he was reading <laughs> exactly the same text as as you are. Um, but I think I think he's quite familiar. Um, he he was one of the most literate and lucid minds. He has one of the most literate and lucid minds of anyone I've ever met. Um, really, a brilliant man. Mm. Um, Susanna Mushtaq says, "Bravo! Thank you for your work." Okay, do you want a, any refutation of her remark? <laughs> I, I, no, I I I agree with her, and I think it's great. Thank you, Susanna, for that. Jan Alexander, are there Uyghur writers you who have been able to write about the conditions in the internment camps? Mm. Well, there is the Uyghur Human Rights Project in in Washington D.C. That the, the you know the diaspora has written about it, I think. But what about yeah? Mm -hmm. So there's a there's some poetry that's come out of the camps, even by very established poets. Um, one of them is is was a, a poem that's accredited to um, a scholar named Ab, um, what is his name? Jalaladin. Um, his surname is Jalaladin, um, Abdul Qadir Jalaladin, um, who was a professor at, at one of the universities in Arumti. Um, and he, this po poet was, he's a poet and a, and a public figure. Um, and this poem um, was sort of translated orally, transmitted orally out of the camp and prison that he was in and found its way to the West. And a, a translator, uh, uh, Joshua Freeman, translated this and it's, it's published and is widely available. Um, uh, I think it was published in the New York Times. Um, there's other uh, former detainees who also are trained as poets and writers. Um, uh, 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 a young Kazakh woman named Anar Sabit, who was featured in the New Yorker profile about the camps. She's written these really beautiful, moving poetry about her experience in the cells and in the camps, uh, what that was like. Um, it is available in English translation. She wrote it in Chinese. Um, but uh, hasn't received a, the audience it deserves yet. There's also many memoirs, a number of memoirs that have been published by former detainees. Um, and you can find those as well. Um, if you do a little bit of Googling around. Um, some are former detainees and there's even a, one a former camp instructor who's written a memoir about her experiences as well. Um, I think that one, that book is called The Chief Witness. These memoirs. Um, so yes, there's, talking... there's some memoirs that are emerging now. Mm -hmm. Those are in English? Yeah, I mean, usually the, the, that's not the language they were written in initially. Usually they're, they've been translated from another language. Um, but yes, you can find four or five uh, of these memoirs now. So outside of China in the, so there are many, many Uyghurs in Kazakhstan and in Germany and Turkey and Washington, D.C., New York. So... Is there a, a lively literature in the Uyghur language in, in the outside of China? Mm -hmm. um, in Turkey is really the center now of Uyghur cultural production. Um, there's a number of bookshops and publishers that Uyghur diaspora folks have set up there. Um, and they're beginning to, to republish books that have been banned, like, like Perhat's books and, and others. Um, and they're also starting to surface some texts that were never published in Uyghur language in China because they they were not um, the authors were too afraid to publish them there. So these are books by very famous uh, authors, um, Abdur Abdurrahim Otgur, who's uh, one of the, the world's uh, Uyghur's like, leading poets. He wrote a memoir um, that was smuggled out, and it will be uh, published at some point soon. Um, so there is this vibrant scene, and they've also uh, built this uh, digital archives of, of Uyghur texts, of scanned books, um, and make them freely available to, to anyone who wants to read them. Um, and so, you know, Uyghur traditions are really sort of carrying forward. And I think like with the publication of Perhat's book, The Backstreets, I think there will be a even, even more interest in Uyghur literature and Uyghur translation. Um, so I think, you know, this won't be the first of novel that we see in English. Um, Perhat was has a sequel to the, the Backstreets that he would love to see, he told me, uh, in translation as well. So uh, at some point, I think we'll, we'll see another book from Perhat. So here's a, a question from Rebecca Chisik. What do you think is the most important thing to take away from this novel? Well, the novel, 
does a lot and it's so it's it's powerful in in its framing of life uh on the run um one of the things i didn't mention in my talk is the the role of fog and or smog really um that is a sort of a character in the novel um a kind of vagueness in terms of how the protagonist is able to perceive um places in the city um and how that that cold the cold fog starts to seep into his body as a kind of infection um and that you know speaks to the reality of Urumqi, the city uh, in the winter time it's very very cold it's get it's just south of siberia um and in the 2000s when a lot of the book was written um it was one of the most polluted cities in the world uh, because uh, to heat the city, they needed to use coal power. Um, and so, you know, Parhat is, is thinking about his own experience, his own life um, uh, of this and his experience of the city as he's writing, I'm sure. But it's doing something more than this. Um, Mentaman Allah, the one uh, scholar I mentioned who wrote about the two-faced figure his reading of the fog is that it, it has to do with the vagueness of life itself and of truth that we don't because Uyghur history has been overtaken by the institutions because news and facts about life and about the future are all filtered through the state apparatus um, and are thought to be untrue by most Uyghurs um, rumor and sort of you know, feeling things out as you go is is how truth is discerned. And so there's a kind of underlying vagueness to life itself in terms of what sort of future is possible um, and and also like what what really happened in the past. Um, and and some of that is being evoked through this novel. So I think there's that. I think it's also it's a it's an important story of of what colonialism looks like and feels like. Um, and I think, um, should be thought of as a parallel to other texts that look at the same sort of phenomenon. And, and as it's doing that, it's showing us that what's happening in China is not unique to China alone. Um, there, there's aspects of it that are quite singular, but it's also you know, connected to broader phenomena, um, to the, you know, what happens when, things, when, when ethnic difference is racialized. This is what it looks like. This is what it feels like um that's that's here too so it's an every person story it's also a very Uyghur story too the, all of the imagery from the villages um from his growing up um his relationship to his parents um you know those are stories that only a Uyghur could tell um and and so it evokes that past as well the traditions that hold Uyghurs together and build a future for them let me uh follow up on that uh comment to ask i guess two big fat questions you know very big fat sort of academic but interesting questions in your concept of terror capitalism and i have not read the book but you are uh talking about at least three things going on and i wonder how you integrate them if i understand correctly so one thing that's going on, maybe you don't talk about this so much, maybe it's coming from my poli sci point of view, is uh, Beijing seeking to um, uh, consolidate territorial control over this territory because it's part of the People's Republic of China, but it has, as you said, in the past been independent a little bit. And it's, you know, so there's just the imposition of control through measures of control, period. Secondly, there's settler colonialism, which you've talked about here. In fact, you described yourself as an Ohio settler. I wonder what you mean by that. <laughs> but I, all right, never mind that. Third, this thing about capitalism, which I understand you to be arguing is that uh, the um, enterprises come in and create a proletariat by dispossessing. So there seem to be these three sort of analytical engines working for you to understand what's going on in this territory. And is, do I have that right? And do you integrate them or are they three separate engines? 
<laughs> well, I try to inter integrate some of that, yeah. So I would see that settler colonialism and, and state directed uh, territory, territorial control is pretty closely allied and really some basically the same thing. Um, so, you know, the, the process of moving Han people to the southern part of the region, the Uyghur majority area is part of the the opening up of the West campaign, which is a state directed development project to build infrastructure across what were seen as underdeveloped parts of the country, um, which is about, um, you know, building the nation, I suppose, developing the nation as a whole, but also about resources and the need to source materials to drive their economy in the East. Um, and the Uyghur region is a source of so many raw materials, which is you know, why the settler population was necessary to, to extract those things and, and also to integrate it with the country. You're, you're not wrong to, to note that there's an ethno-nationalism element of this, I think, you know, in terms of what it means to pacify this region, these, these people who are potentially foreign, a foreign force um, or could be mobilized as a, as a threat, uh, as separatists, um, that we need to have more sort of patriotic, loyal people um, to occupy this space and make sure we maintain control over it. Open up the West, you know, feeds directly into the, the uh, next campaign, which is the Belt and Road Initiative, which starts in the 2010s and opens up from Xinjiang, the Uyghur region, to South Asia, Pakistan, and Central Asia and Kazakhstan, which are, especially Central Asia, is a really important player now in the Chinese uh, economy in terms of natural gas and oil. Um, so maintaining stability over this region is important for a lot of geostrategic, geoeconomic reasons. Um, so that's that's happening. Sure, that's state directed. There's also, I think, um, particular kinds of economy that are being built out. Um, so it's not only that they want the land and the resources, they also now want the bodies of the people that live there. They want to make them productive as workers. And so that is part of the process of proletarianizing that population, bringing the factories to them, and then putting them to work in forms of assigned or forced labor. Um, and so they're actively pulling people off of their farms and saying, now you're going to go work in a factory, um, or they're sending them to camps first and then saying, now you're going to go work in a factory. They use the camp as a coercive threat to hold people in place. So if you don't work, you'll be sent to the factory, or you'll be sent to the camp or to prison. Um, there's a third component to this that you didn't mention, um, which is has to do with surveillance capitalism, which is something that Shoshana Zuboff, a, 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 a emeritus professor from the Harvard Business School, talks about in relation to the way that social media and uh, computer vision technology companies, data valence companies like Google and Facebook and Twitter, um, seek to harvest our data as users, as citizens and consumers, um, in order to build predictive products out of that. Um, and so the I see the, the Uyghur region as a sort of a test case um, for uh, the leading technology companies in China to develop new artificial intelligence enabled tools, like face recognition systems, like data valence tools, which are tools that look at mass amounts of data and uh, assess it and predict things based on that data. It's not as, as though like those, those tools don't remain simply security tools. They're adapted then for other purposes like smart warehousing or you know, self-driving cars or those sorts of things is, is the sorts of tools that, that these companies are interested in. But the Uyghur uh, sort of experience of sort of battle testing uh, uh, the, the technology um, is is a part of that process. And so I see this as a kind of racialized surveillance capitalism that's happening in a in a, a settler colonial context and really should also be seen as part of the global economy because the the technology that's being used is has so many linkages to Western companies and some aspects of it are built by Western companies. Um, and the resources that are extracted through the labor, um, is mostly for export, or a lot of it's for export through fast fashion, um, especially in textile manufacturing. Um, and so as consumers, we're implicated in, in it as well. So there's, I'm, I'm trying to say that this is very far away, but it's also very close to us. It's a very complicated story that has all of these moving parts that together, you know, is something I'm going to call terror capitalism.
Okay, good. Let me go back to the Q&A. So um, Adam Carroll says, thank you for this very meaningful and important work. What can the Uyghur diaspora do to share this? And is there wider readership in Turkey and elsewhere? Do you see any traction for including this work in discussion in international agencies like UNESCO and other UN agencies? And I think by this work, he means, of course, the translation of the novel. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, one of the things that I've been gratified to see is that the Penn, Penn International, which is a it's an international like NGO that focuses on on literature, but is has a particular focus on on international literature written by people who have been persecuted and so on. That it's Perhat's work has already been recognized by them. Um, he's received an award uh, as a result of that, um, and that. I think that means as well that, that more Uyghur literature will be produced and made available through translation. Um, so yes, I think that these these things need to be recognized by international bodies um, as as heritage that is of the world and uh, is part of the human story. Um, and I, I think some of that is already starting to happen. There needs to be more, of course. Um, but I'm I'm happy to see people really engaging this book um, and maybe finding out about. The Uyghur story uh, through an unexpected way, in an unexpected way, um, uh, and and maybe given a, a deeper window into what life is like for Uyghurs um, by engaging their texts directly. Um, Abigail Stickney, hi Darren, thanks for your presentation. I'm wondering, have you come across any terms that can replace colonization? as the term for the processes you've been describing, do you see terror capitalism as being an element of the plantation plantation scene? I think, uh, or do you see this, Darren? Maybe it's an- Plantation uh, scene? Is that an anthro term that I don't know? <laughs> what, what term would you use to describe contemporary sites of this kind of dehumanization and colonization that don't involve the terrorism aspect or discourse? But do play into global economic markets. Is that is what is is there a plantation aspect to what's going on? Would you say? Sure. So I mean, industrialized agriculture um, and plantations have historically been a, a tool of colonial powers. So you see that in India historically, um, and you see that kind of ongoing in in the ways that. Uh, that raw materials are extracted from global south nations in particular. Um, and I think so by talking about plantation scene, I think the uh, question asker is is trying to link it up to things like the Anthropocene, which is has to do with climate change um, and the role of of uh, manufacturing in 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 climate change. Um, so I think colonialism is probably the is the biggest term, but I mean, and capitalism is as well. I think you can think about colonialisms as as sort of frontiers of capital expansion. Like that's that's one of the ways to think about capitalism in relation to colonialism. Um, this process is because it's focused on Muslim others and on the uh, sort of counterterrorism threat. Um, I think it is somewhat specific to the context I'm looking at, um, although I think you can look to the ways that uh, technology and economy is being marshaled in India in relation to people in Kashmir or in other places uh, where there's kind of contemporary colonialisms um, as quite similar uh, to what I'm looking at. Um, there's other terms like disaster capitalism that, that others have used to talk about how um, places where uh, natural disasters, climate-induced natural disasters happen, and and industries respond and 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 sort of benefit from the response to a disaster, but don't actually seek to offset the future of disasters. Um, you know, that's another way to think about this. Um, but sure, I think you know all of these terms have their their place, um, and and what we really need to think about is the particulars of what we're the sites that we're looking at. Um, to think about which term might be of the of most use uh, for that site, um, and then to think about how it's linked up, you know, how these different terms link up with each other, um, uh, and you know how how systems are 
sites in the world are globally connected. Um, that's that's part of what I'm trying to do in my work as well. Yeah, um, Abigail, put if you can put into the Q and A, and I can read it out. Why? Because we don't have the capacity to have you speak directly. Why? It seems as if you're not happy with the term colonization. I'd be curious to know why. Uh, and you know, Darren, you've made this point a couple times, but you know, many people think Xinjiang is far away and peripheral and minority and whatever, Muslim, you know, but it's really very central. I think you've done a great job in sort of centering <clears throat> Xinjiang. <clears throat> okay, here's another one from Adam. Uh, he, he or she says, Abdullah Sawut, the Uyghur writer poet who recently starved to death. Do you know of someone who is translating? Do you know if someone is translating his work? Mm. Um, I know there's some discussion of it, um, and I think there will be a translator at some point. I don't know if someone is actively doing it now. There's a lot of work that needs to be translated, and there's not enough of us to do it. Um, so um, there's more work that needs to be done. But yes, I think many of these Uyghur figures will have their work in translation at some point. Um, and thank you for, for pointing him out. He's, he's an important voice that deserves to have a broader audience too. So then Peter Segan Thaler uh, says, Andrew Nathan, you asked very many good questions. Thank you. For Darren, the book is terrific, as is your translation, and your introduction does a great job of presenting Perhat as so widely read in Camus, existentialism, et cetera. Does that cosmopolitanism alienate him to any extent from other Uyghur literary figures? Can you elaborate on the grounds for which he has been seen as anti-Muslim? Anti-Muslim, he's been seen as anti-Muslim. Mm. Yes, um, so you know a lot of the, the most prominent Uyghur fiction writers uh, are uh, novelists are people who've written about sort of Uyghur history uh, in the socialist realist tradition, um, which is, you know, is a heroic sort of genre of realism that, um, you know, was popularized by in the Soviet Union and in China, um, where the protagonist um, has perhaps some moral failings, but in the end, he is, is the unquestioned hero and sort of conquers um, whatever obstacle he's been confronted by. Um, and then there's also the older sort of Sufi tradition in Uyghur history and Uyghur storytelling that is also quite heroic uh, of the bringers of Islam, the, the kings of the past who defeated enemies and so on. Um, and so the most successful literature in Uyghur traditions are, are historical novels that present Uyghurs as revolutionary heroes um, and, and heroes of the nation. This book is not that. The, the, Perhat's book is about a flawed, unreliable narrator protagonist who is failing to succeed in, in all aspects of life. And so from the outset, this is not set up as like a, an attractive work of literature for a Uyghur audience. It, it doesn't have like kind of an uplifting heroic message. Um, and in general, that's the sort of approach that, that Perhat takes in his work is to sort of think about norms in society and show the absurdity of those norms um, and uh, to question uh, things that are, are kind of given as, as normal. Um, and so his first book that received the most sort of uh, antipathy from the Uyghur public was called um, The Art of Suicide, which is a long book. Um, and is focused on a young a young man um, and sort of his existential angst um, and his his thoughts of suicide, um, his relationship to religion, which is a controversial topic, um, and so that was why it was viewed as as anti-Muslim um, and as sort of anti-establishment by the establishment. Um, so the state publishing houses in for in Uyghur language in the region are run by were run by Uyghurs. Um, and these were mostly party affiliated people, but they're also sort of guarders of, they, they guarded the Uyghur tradition and didn't want to have anything that was in, in the tradition that was seen as sort of, you know, antagonistic to the authority or, or, or tradition. 
um, and would denigrate you know, Islam in any way. Um, Farhat is a Muslim himself. He's not trying to um, you know, push back against Islam in, in all of its forms. He has a, a lot of problems with certain expressions of his, you know, the way that Islam is used by some. Um, but anyway, he was perceived as, as anti-Muslim for those reasons, and he was blacklisted for almost a decade as a result. And so it was really difficult for him to publish his work. He was also seen because of his you know, iconoclasm as sort of the leader of the next generation of, of Uyghurs. So it worked in both, both directions um, as you know, anti-establishment and therefore the leader of the rebellion. <laughs> I'm speaking only in, in literary terms, not not uh, as um, you know someone who is fomenting any sort of political revolt. Mm -hmm. By the way, we might mention um, a recent translation of some articles by Ilham Toti, right? Called "We Uyghurs Have No Say," mm. and imprisoned writer speaks, which is published by Verso in 2022. Um, because I, I thought of that because of the question, uh, Peter's question about sort of uh, Perhat's relationship to other Uyghur intellectuals. And I don't know what the two of, is there anything to say about the relationship mm -hmm. to two people? Um, so Ilham Tokti was an economist and was teaching in Beijing and writing almost exclusively in Chinese language uh, because he was trying to really appeal to the Chinese audience to Han readers to sort of explain why Uyghurs are upset with what's happening in their homeland and some policy you know options that would be available to the government if they wanted to reform. Um, and then he was sentenced to life in prison in 2014, really sort of near the beginning of the People's War on Terror and sentenced to life in prison. Um, and so really sent a chill through Uyghur intellectual uh, disc, you know, conversation because he you know, in general, he's his ideas were reformists, were were just kind of logical in terms of how to respond to what's happening. Um, and the mm. dissent he was presenting was very mild. I mean, it was it, it, it was the feeling of almost all Uyghurs, you know, the sorts of things he was saying. Um, so they were aware of each other, but I don't know if they interacted in person or, or not. Um, I would say Ilham Tokti was a lot more direct in terms of his critique of the state than Parhat has been in his uh, work. Uh, but they're also working in quite different genres. So, you know, Parhat is writing literature and, and you know, trying to understand some of the same phenomena, but, but in quite different ways. But as you say, I, I read uh, uh, these uh, essays of Toti as very pragmatic and constructive, but telling a, a truth, <laughs> you know, that you're also describing of racialization, discrimination, oppression, mm -hmm. and so things could be could be made much better, but not within the scope of apparently Beijing's understanding of what the problem is in Xinjiang and among all Muslims in their country. Well, Darren, thank you so much. It was a, another great presentation, and um, we really are grateful for it. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for having me. It was an honor. Bye-bye to everybody. <laughs>